Good afternoon, everyone. Nice to see you all. Two um, announcements before we begin. <clears throat> At the end of the lecture, when we have the reception in the gallery, if you're from town and you're not on our mailing list, there'll be this clipboard where you can put your name and email address. We'd like to let you know about future events, okay? Second and very important, if you have a cell phone or a smartphone, would you turn it off now? It'd be great. <clears throat> it's really, really good to see everyone here and really good to see Andre here. <clears throat> it's nice to have you on this afternoon for the last of our Inspiring History, Shaping the Future lecture series. Having Andre Debuse the third here to close out the series is like having an ice cream sundae after a great meal. And now I'm going to put a cherry on top of that Sunday. Former SBC adjunct professor and writer Megan Mayhew Bergman will read from her recently published work, book of short stories called Birds of a Lesser Paradise, one month from today on May 3rd, same time, same place. There'll be more information about it, but you might want to mark that down. For me, this is the best collection of short stories I've read since Dancing After Hours, which is a marvelous collection of stories by Andre's father. So you don't want to miss Megan, and I don't think she's in the audience today. She may come to the reception afterwards. Today's special for a lot of reasons, and I'd like to acknowledge another friend of the college and former clinical nursing professor, the writer Kevin O'Hara. Kevin spoke about his first book, The Last of the Donkey Pilgrims, as part of our lecture series two years ago. And his most recent book, which I have, A Lucky Irish Lad, is an extremely enjoyable and honest account of his life growing up in Pittsfield. Now for Andre. It's good to bring someone from my neck of the woods, the east coast of New England, here to this beautiful place in the west coast of New England. <laughs> I'm from Lawrence the smallest in area of the three mill cities in the Merrimack Valley. Andre's from Haverhill, of course, and works in Lowell, hailed in 1842 by Charles Dickens when he came to Lowell as the world's model industrial city, and still today, larger than either Haverhill or Lawrence. And here's a fun fact for you all. This year, we celebrate the 200th birthday of Charles Dickens. I'm not going to repeat what's in the program sheet you received when you entered the theater today about Andre, but I'm going to relate to you four instances in which I came to know Andre as a generous role model, a terrific speaker, and a powerful writer. <clears throat> First, about 10 years ago, when Andre was invited to speak at Riviera College, where I was working at the time, Andre came to a meeting of faculty and administrators. You'll remember that prior to the opening convocation at which he would speak. It wasn't long after House of Sand and Fog had been made into a major motion picture starring Ben Kingsley and Jennifer Connelly. What impressed everyone was Andre's declaration that he wouldn't be speaking to impress faculty or administrators. He told us that he likes to speak to young people because he knew firsthand, almost predicting the content of Townie, how easy it is to go in a way that is not healthy. Andre told us that he thought it was important for young people to hear from those who have gone before them and have been tested by temptations and the dangers around us. Second, when he did speak at the Rivier opening convocation, he told a story about, I think it was a family gathering he went to not long after House of Sand and Fog gained notoriety. At the gathering, he was greeted by one of those there who might have been a little bit depressed about his situation and who said to Andre something like, now, you've, now that you've made it big, you won't need to work anymore. <clears throat> Andre told everyone that he was incredulous because he loved writing. And then he gave his message to the students, which was, do the thing that makes you happier than anything else in the world. Do the thing that makes you happier than anything else in the world. Third. When he accepted the invitation to speak at our commencement in 2009, we decided to give our graduating students his latest book at that time, The Garden of Last Days. 
Not only did Andre sign every one of those books, but he took the time to address each graduating student personally in his inscriptions. And fourth, when he addressed the graduates in May of 2009, he told them to face the adversity of our economy and foreign affairs, the two wars we were embroiled in, and to learn from it, become stronger, and to go on to make a difference in the world by doing those things that bring joy to all. For Andre, those things are writing and giving of his time to teach others the lessons he's learned. Whether he's writing about a fa the fabulous and underappreciated authors like he does in the introduction to this novel, The Hair of Harold Rue by Thomas Williams, a vignette you probably will recall from reading Townie, or answering students' questions honestly and robustly, like he did this past summer when one of my students asked him this question. Did writing Townie make you feel happy that you've come so far, or was it hard and emotional to relive some tough moments? Quote, I'd be working in my soundproof writing cave in my basement, Andre answered, then take a short break to walk upstairs to the kitchen for more coffee. After having imagined, through written memory, our low income and trying past, I'd step into this new and spacious house I built with my bare hands for my wife and kids and me. And I'd shake my head at where my life has taken me. I'd say a prayer of deep gratitude, pour myself some coffee, then head back down to my cave, where I knew I'd have to cut back into old wounds again. For the most part, because so many years have passed since my youth, this wasn't so painful. At other times, like my dad's death, it was. This is the kind of honesty and generosity you get when you read and hear Andre Debuse, and this is what you'll get today. Please welcome my friend and SVC's friend, Andre Debuse III. Thank you, Al. My goodness. Well, I've got two mics. I feel like God. <laughs> God. I don't need. Wow, is this as loud for you as it is for me? Is that too loud or is it fine? Okay. Al, thank you. And, and it's, a, it's a joy and an honor to be back. Um, you know, and thank you for inviting me, Provost Cicicio, my friend Al from Lawrence, Mass. <laughs> so my favorite part of this getting up in front of people stuff is I really, you know, I don't mind lecturing and reading talks and reading. I, I like reading my work out loud, but not for too long, because I, I like that Q&A. And I know that when I go to a, a reading or a talk, it's my favorite part, too, in the audience, when we get to actually have a conversation, and we don't just sit there and, no matter how good a speaker might be, I think the fun part's that conversation. So I'm going to take, you said we have five hours, I'm going to take four hours, <laughs> I'm going to take about 28.9 minutes, and then let's spend the rest of the time in a conversation. It goes by too fast, if you don't mind. All right, so I should tell you, I mean, for those of you who haven't read Tony or know much about me or, or it, um, I'm mainly a fiction writer. I've been doing this my whole adult life, and I just love writing. I love how hard it is. I love how, like right now, I had the most beautiful drive out here, Al. I'm so glad I got lost and lost your directions, because I'm driving through the mountains. I'm listening to Lucinda Williams and Outcast because my kids left it in my truck. And, and, I'm, and I'm, you know, I'm between, I'm between uh, stories. I finished a novella a few like five weeks ago, and I'm getting ready to write a new one, which is my new book I hope to finish this year. And, um, and, it's, and I'm just beginning to, to see the first scene. And so as I'm driving, I'm, I'm, I'm listening to this music, and I'm looking at the mountains and the boulders and the rocks and the, you know, the small little houses like I grew up in, and I, and I just, I, I just want to quickly get to my desk and descend into the dream world. See, one of the things I find so moving about human beings and, and is that we all have an imagination. You know, I was at a book club, one of these city book clubs, which is really a lovely thing to happen to a writer. The whole town reads your book, and they put you in a theater, and they all come and talk about it. And I remember a, a city in California did that for me, and I, I, on the flight back, the five-hour flight back to the east, I had this weird bad taste in my mouth. I said, well, what's not to like? They just, they flew you out there. They, they read, all, all these people read your book, you signed books for like six hours, you, you know, got a great steak and a vodka martini, They're, I mean, what's not to like? 
And I realized what it was. There was, a, there was a sort of a subtle energy in the theater of, oh, we lowly readers bow down to you, imaginative writers. We're so grateful to you for having imagination so you write these books we get to read. And it just doesn't, it doesn't, sit, it doesn't square with what I know about people. Because all you have to do is have kids or have been a kid yourself to know that every kid gets an imagination. Every kid gets one. And you know, I've been teaching writing for 20-something years now, and I've, I think I've probably taught seven to 8,000 young and not-so-young writers. And, and through that experience, I've concluded that not only does everybody get an imagination, I don't think anybody's is any better than anybody else's. That's not to suggest that some people don't come up with more interesting stuff than others because we know it's the case. But I don't think that's the fault of the imagination. I think it's the fault of the writing tools and how we get into the imagination that God gives all of us or the universe, whatever you want to call what brings us into this world. All right, so there's a wonderful line from the writer of Flannery O'Connor from her essay, The Nature and Aim of Fiction. I love this. She says, there is a certain grain of stupidity the writer can hardly do without. <laughs> I'll repeat that. There is a certain grain of stupidity the writer can hardly do without, and that is the quality of having to stare. So I think one of the central things I find myself saying in writing classes, and, and I, I, I think I'll say until I'm no longer on this planet, writers don't know what the hell we're doing, which is the fun of it. Whenever I've tried to outline a story, whenever I've set out to say something, even in an essay or a book review, um, certainly a novel or a short story or a poem or a novella, whenever I've set out to say something, I strangle it. I've, I may have said one thing honestly, but I've learned over the years if I just surrender to what's coming and allow it to come in its full force, I will say 15 things. And I'm only conscious of maybe half of two, which would be one. <laughs> I've never said half of two. Um, it makes me feel, I don't know, like a physicist. <laughs> Play, uh, William Faulkner was asked late in his life, Mr. Faulkner, what's the main thing that the writer needs, sir, in order to have a shot at creating the kind of art you have, sir, with words? He said, well, it ain't talent. <laughs> he said, I used to think it was talent, but I, I don't think so anymore. Well, he said, well, what is it? What do you think he said? He narrowed it down to one quality of mind. Imagination. What do you think it is? Imagination, imagination is certainly, uh, he would agree, without, without this quality of mind, you cannot fuel the imagination. Think of, think of the imagination as the car, and this quality of mind is the gas. Perseverance. Oh, gold staff for that dude. <laughs> yeah. Perseverance. I've said perseverance a few of you. He, said, he talked about that a lot. He talked about diligence, perseverance, endurance. And he's right. Because you do fall out of love with what you're writing very soon. And just like marriage, you continue. <laughs> we all know what we're saying. No. The romance waxes and wanes. And then marriage is a job description. Being married, as you married people know, is not a state of being. I always tell young people this, especially guys at bachelor parties. <laughs> hey, uh, Tony, being a husband isn't just like a title, it's a job description, a list of tasks. And you're going to be expected to do them whether you feel like it or not for the rest of your life. And she has a list of tasks too, and the same goes for her. And actually, I think it's a beautiful thing, and I think it makes for a strong marriage. And by the way, I've been happily married for 24 years. Yeah. All right, so, so curiosity, his exact quote was, curiosity insight to mull and to muse why it is that man does what he does and if you have that then talent makes no difference whether you've got it or not i could not agree more um, and i've seen it i we don't have time to talk about this with my students but i've seen it with my students the ones who've gone on to publish books produce movies make movies write poems plays they're, they're the ones who are frankly the pains in the ass in the, in the class <laughs> they would say things like well wait a minute didn't she have her umbrella open? So why is her glasses wet in the car? She had the umbrella open. Why would they be wet? Wait a minute, she had her groceries in one hand. What? All these really irritating students, they're the ones who went on to produce all this work. 
And I would submit to you, because they weren't any more talented than the other people in the room, but they couldn't shut off their curiosity. We actually say that. We'll read an interesting story in the newspaper about a you know, man leaves wife, takes all nine dogs, drops each one off in a Home Depot parking lot all the way to New Jersey. I mean, you'll read something like that. Jersey, the Herald, but... And you'll say, people actually say, oh, honey, can you imagine? They actually, we actually use that expression. And we go, in fact, I can't cop, stop thinking about those damn dogs. Why nine dogs? Why do you take them? Why the Home Depot parking lot? Why do you drop each one off? What kind of a car would he have to drive to hold nine dogs? <laughs> on and on. So, this little memoir, you know, um, it came from this scene from my life. My brother and I, uh, my brother's the, the, the family genius. He's, he's just, he taught himself when he was 13 years old, everyone, how to play classical guitar. Bach preludes on the guitar by listening to a record player. One of these guys. He designed my huge house, getting all the plumbing chases and electrical things right and all the live load, dead load, without uh, any study of architecture. He's one of these guys. When we were little, for birthday, birthdays, he'd get guitar strings, you know, canvases, paints. I'd get underwear. <laughs> So, my brother designed my house. And, because um, Oprah had put her magic wand on my, my third book, which is about the sixth I'd written, I had money for the first time. I was in my early 40s. And I was going to build the first home I would ever live in without a landlord. My parents never owned a house when we were growing up. I never owned a house. My wife never owned a house. Not a big problem. This is a first world problem, by the way. <laughs> I'd had landlords for the first almost five decades of my life. So now we're building a house, and it's more of a big deal to me than I realized when I was building it. And it was really such a beautiful ordeal. I recommend it. You know, uh, we, we did it all. We framed it. We did, we did everything, except the electrical and, and plumbing. So uh, we're about six months in. We're still, no, no, no. We're about six weeks in. We're still framing. And I'm hiring some young guys to do labor that day. And at the coffee break, they're talking baseball. And my brother, who's in his 40s, Takes a hit off his cigarette and says, um, seriously, he's like 43. So what? There's an American League and a National League? <laughs> I said, yeah, I think so. Well, it sounds like the same thing. What's that about? I said, well, I don't really know, and I didn't really know. The truth is, somehow my brother and I missed all these sports with balls and pucks in them. And we grew up north of Boston in Red Sox Nation, Patriots Nation, Celtics Nation, Bruins Nation. I didn't know all four of those teams until about 10 years ago. My brother today, even now, he, he couldn't tell you who Tom Brady is or Kevin Euclid. Couldn't tell you. So how did this happen? So meanwhile, as you parents know, whatever your kids get into, you get into. They get into bugs, you become a bug expert. They get into dinosaurs, you can say Micropachycephalosaurus, right? So my kids got into all that, but then like regular boys, we have a, a son, daughter, son. Austin, Ariadne, Elias. They're now 19, 16, 14. But when they were little, my boys got into baseball, like a lot of normal American boys. They got into T-ball, and then C-ball with the coach pitches, then B-ball when the kids start to pitch. And right around B-ball, when they're like eight or nine, I noticed that the coaches are kind of like Marine Corps drill instructors. <laughs> and um, I remember my son, Austin, was a pitcher. He's still a pitcher. And um, it was the championship, you know, whatever, the playoffs. And one of the coaches, who had a shaved head like a drill instructor, and weighed about 260 pounds, is yelling to about a 42-pound kid on the mound, on his team, I don't want nothing but strikes, Timmy! You hear me? Nothing but strikes! And I'm thinking, Pedro Martinez doesn't throw nothing but strikes. <laughs> so the following year, I volunteered to be a baseball coach to protect my son from the Marine Corps. <laughs> Forgetting, I didn't know one thing about baseball. <laughs> well, how hard can it be? You hit, you run, you catch, you know, score. So I had a lot of moments like this where, you know, we'd be doing a game and I'd go, run, Bobby, run, buddy. And this little nine year go, coach, he's not allowed. He's against the rules. You can't run now. Oh, you can't. Come back, Bob. You're out. I'm, I'm sorry, Bobby. <laughs> so I thought, I might write the 
first funny thing of my life. I'm going to write an essay about baseball. And the question, back again back to Faulkner's curiosity, the question fueling the essay is, how in the hell did I miss baseball? Because by the way, I love this sport now. I watch like 80 games a year. I mean, we're going to Fenway in like three weeks. As soon as my son gets back from college in Ohio, we're going. I'm a Pats fan. I take my shirt off. I paint myself colors. <laughs> I'm like nine as a sports fan. I still don't really know all the rules. It's kind of crazy. So, so I was, as I was writing this essay, and by the way, I had a contract with my publisher to deliver a collection of personal essays, because I've written a few over the years, and it's a beautiful form, and I really love it. And this essay was, I thought, going to ask the question, how did I miss, ba miss baseball? I mean, normally, you know, in America, the mythic story is, um, you know, your father, the father throws to the boys, the boys learn that way, they become fans. But how is it that my sons taught me baseball instead of the way around? So... 150 pages later, 500 pages later, I realized I wasn't writing an essay. And instead, I was writing about what I was doing instead of playing games. Like probably 56.2% of you, sadly, in this room, you come from a broken home. That's, I think it's almost 57% in this culture. So we all know divorce. We actually throw that term around lightly. Like, oh, yeah, she's from a broken home. Like, oh, yeah, she's got brown eyes. We all know it hurts. We know that some marriages must end. Some are really toxic and divorce can be good, but it always hurts. It hurts everybody. We always know, we know that. I, th I think, frankly, it gets too minimized in our culture, especially for the kids. So, so my parents divorced about nine years after marriage. They had eloped from southern Louisiana, married when they were 19 and 18. And my dad joined the Marines. He goes to the Ira Writers Workshop, he turns into, as, as, as Al um, talked about a little bit, he became the master short story writer on Dream Abuse, my father. But when they were young, it didn't work out. I, I think now, actually, if they got married when they were a little older, or, and or if the 60s hadn't hit right when they got married, with all the you know, experimentation with social mores and all the, the upheaval socially of the 60s, they may have actually survived as a marriage. But they didn't. Uh, they got divorced. My father uh, moved to Bradford, where he was teaching at Bradford Junior College, which became Bradford College, which sadly went belly up a few years ago after 200-something years. And um, what happened to my mom happens to too many married people. And I, I actually see it in my own generation. And I'm sure, I'm sure you have too. Where you're, you know, all these people are friends with the marriage. They've been friends with them for years. The marriage ends. And then all the friends rally around one and dump the other. It's bizarre to me. I see it happening all the time. I try not to do it, but I think I've done it with one or two couples. And so here, so here my mother, by the way, was a beauty pageant winner from South Louisiana. She was also, and still is, smart, articulate, poetic, charming, charismatic, lights up the room. My father also lights up the room. And, but everybody dumped my beautiful mother from my beautiful father. She's also from southern Louisiana, and her third grade educated father, my grandfather, who was a pipe fitter, Elmer Lamar Lowe, who we called Pappy, he said, there ain't been no damn divorces in this family, and if this don't work out, you ain't coming home. So it didn't even occur to her to go back home to Louisiana. So my father at the time, in the late 60s, was making $7,000 a year, seven. Now, that was a lot more then than it is now, but it still wasn't much for four kids, a rented house, a car, clothes, food, all that stuff we all know about. So now his $7,000 has to support not only his new apartment and his new $100 car, but all of us. So we, we went from poor to poorer, the way a lot of families do who get divorced who are already financially strapped. But also, I have to say we were... Part of this social class we don't talk a lot about in this culture, too, we were the educated working poor. My mother went back to school. First, she got work as a nurse's aide and a waitress, worked her way through school quickly, got a degree where the big money is in the social services. <laughs> I'm very proud of her. She was a social worker for 30 years, working with poor families. And so even though my mother was educated, my father was educated, I, I grew up in poor neighborhoods because we had no money. 
So I'm going to stop talking. I'm going to read about 13 minutes. The accidental memoir that rose from that baseball essay begins um, in 1970, I guess. Right now, I think it's 1973. I was 14 years old in 73. And um, I think all you need to know is my sister is Suzanne, older sister Suzanne, younger brother Jeb, little sister Nicole. And this is Haverhill, Mass., right down the river from Lawrence and Aldousia. <laughs> On the other side of the river was Bradford. It's where a lot of jocks at the high school lived, the kids who wore corduroys and sweaters and looked clean. It's where houses had big green lawns. It's where the college was where Pop taught. It's where he lived in an apartment building with Theo Matrakos and his friend, Dave Supple, a writer too. Since leaving our mother, Pop had lived in a few places, but we rarely saw them and never slept there. Years later, I would hear my father say the divorce had left him dating his children. That still meant picking us up every Sunday for a matinee, and if he had the money, an early dinner somewhere. For a few years now, he was taking us to church, too. He'd pull up in his rusted-out Lancer and drive us to Mass at Sacred Hearts in Bradford Square. The five of us would walk down the aisle between the crowded pews, Jeb and I with our long hair, actually to our waists, Suzanne in her tight hip huggers, Nicole in her brace she now wore for scoliosis, Pop, one of the only men in church not wearing a jacket or tie. He refused to put money in the collection basket, too. Many times I'd hear him say, you think Jesus ever wore a fucking tie? <laughs> Did Jesus spend money on buildings? One night, we were still living at the doctor's house. One of the, excuse me, just interruption. One of the first houses my mom rented in this town used to be a doctor's office. And at least once a week, we latchkey kids would be lying on the floor watching our 500 hours of bad TV. And someone would walk right into the living room and sit down. <laughs> and most people saw right away no plastic plants and no receptionists. And it was filthy. And there was, you know, magazines all over the place and depressed kids watching Gilligan's Island. But one guy sat down, grabbed the paper off the floor, and sat there for like half an hour. <laughs> His jacket and tie and... You know, finally he looked up and said, this is the doctor's office, isn't it? Uh, uh, no, he moved. <laughs> <laughs> it's the only funny moment in the whole damn book, so that's it. <laughs> One night when we were still living at the doctor's house, I heard Mom on the phone trying to convince Pop that he should start taking out each of us one at a time, that he was never going to know us as individual people if he didn't. I don't know if I cared then about that or not, but a cool sweat broke out on my forehead just thinking about being alone with Pop. I had never been alone with him. What would I say? What would we talk about? What would we do? When my mom got off the phone, she said, I can't believe it. Your father says he'll be too shy with each of you. He's scared of his own kids. This made me feel better and worse. But every Wednesday night, he'd drive up to the house and take one of us back to his apartment across the river. It was on the third floor of an old brick building covered with ivy. Across the street was the Bradford Green, a lawn and trees and a gazebo. And you could see it from his bedroom where his bed was always made and there were shelves of books and his black wooden desk. I remembered from when he used to live with us. Its surface clean and organized. Notebooks stacked neatly beside his typewriter, beside his humidor and pipe stand. Six or eight of them each with a white pipe cleaner sticking out of the mouthpiece. In his small kitchen, we'd cook something, pasta and a quick tomato sauce and garlic bread we warmed in the oven, maybe a bacon and cheese omelet. This was something I looked forward to the most. It seemed I was hungry all the time. At home across the river, unless Bruce had given our mother a new check, Bruce was my mother's boyfriend in many years, but he had seven kids of his own in South Boston. Unless Bruce had given our mother a new check, something he was able to do less and less now, there just wasn't much food in the house. Breakfast was usually a Coke from Pleasant Spa, bought with change we'd found in our mother's purse or under the cushions of our wicker couch. When other kids filed into the cafeteria, we didn't have the money, so drifted out back where the pothead stood on the grates, too cool to sit with the others, passing a pipe around, a bag of potato chips, too. Suzanne was selling dope. One afternoon, I stuck my head in her bedroom doorway, and, when she, and she was sitting on her mattress with Glenn P., rolling dozens of joints from a garbage bag full of Mexican gold. Edgar Winter was playing on her record player. 
Kids at school walked up to her with a hungry look in their eyes, and my sister had cash, and after school she'd sometimes buy us subs, potato chips and Cokes and candy bars, our first real meal of the day. When Mom got home from work at close to 8 o'clock, she'd open a can of SpaghettiOs or stew for us and heat it up on the stove. Sometimes she'd fry us Spam or make that Frito pie, too tired to do much else, too broke to buy much else. And Bruce didn't cook. He drank bourbon in the kitchen with her and talk about the new job he had in Boston, doing the same thing she was, getting slumlords to rid their buildings of lead paint. She'd nod her head, moving quickly in her work clothes, a far-off look in her eyes, as if she was trying to put back together how her life had taken her here to this, this mill town, this canned food she never would have used when she was first married, these four hungry, depressed teenagers, this hovering man who wasn't their father. Those Wednesday nights at Pop's apartment waiting to eat, he probably asked me questions about my life, school, homework, friends, but I remember is feeling like a liar and a fake. I'd be in a t-shirt and jeans I'd washed earlier so they wouldn't smell like dope. I probably told him I was getting good grades, mostly B's, which miraculously I was, but I left out that I regularly skipped, skipped half my classes, slept late, and didn't go to school several days a month. That I was flunking algebra because it was the first class of the morning when I was most high. That Jeb and I and our friend Cleary spent our afternoons looking for a house party where we could get a free buzz. Or we'd be downtown in one of the shops, usually the Army and Navy store, distracting the man behind the register so Cleary could stuff a t-shirt or a pair of socks or wool cap down his pants. Sometimes we called the cops on ourselves. Yeah. One of us would lower his voice and report kids throwing eggs at houses, and we'd give them the street, then run there with eggs in our pockets, and as soon as we saw the cruiser, we'd pelt it and run. <laughs> One time, a cop stuck his head out the window and shouted, I'll shoot you, assholes! We were thinking, so inappropriate for a uniformed police, uniform police officer to swear at us kids. It was only a few years later I thought, it's kind of inappropriate to shoot him, too. <laughs> we ended up down by the river and stand on the railroad trestle over the swirling brown water below betting who had the balls to stay on the longest before the train came, and what would be worse, getting hit by the Boston and Maine, or having to jump into the Merrimack River, where you'd probably be poisoned to death before you drowned anyway. <laughs> there were girls in these neighborhoods who just gave it away. One was Janice Woods, who at 15 had cropped blonde hair and breasts and hips, and liked to walk up to guys and stick her fingers down their pants, just so she could feel them get hard in her hand. Lately, she'd been coming around, spending afternoons with Jeb in his room. I could have told my father about her or her father, Daryl Woods, whom our mother got to know from her work somehow. He was short and wore tight jeans and motorcycle boots, his mustache thick and blonde. One night, he and my mother went out for a drink at the VFW off Monument Square. They were sitting on stools at the bar when a muscular kid with a long ponytail walked in and asked Daryl for a light. Woods looked him over and told him to get lost. The kid pushed him, and Daryl Woods threw a short right into his face and dropped him. It was winter, and when I got up for school the next morning, the house still dark. The hallway lit up Daryl Woods sleeping on the wicker couch in the living room. He was snoring, his arm over his eyes, and I could see the dried blood and stitches in his forearm from his wrist to his elbow. After their drink, my mother and Daryl had gotten back into our car, a used red Toyota. Mom said she just started up when that same muscled kid with the ponytail ran up to her side of the car and yelled, Duck lady! Then he threw a Molotov cocktail past her face at Woods in the passenger side, the bottle smashing against his raised forearm, glass and gasoline spraying over them both. But the fuse had gone out and my mother was flooring it, downshifting and swearing the kid in the street behind them swearing back. The inside of the car smelled like gas for weeks. One March afternoon at a day party down on 7th, Cleary and I taking the joint passed to us in the loud smoking noise. A couple of rent collectors told us to beat it and before we could stand and go, they yanked us up and pushed us down the stairs. They kicked open the door and shoved us onto the plywood porch then off it into the mud. I remember Cleary saying, come on, Ricky, we didn't do nothing, come on. And Ricky J, who months later would get stabbed in the same apartment he was kicking us out of, punched Cleary in the face 
his head snapping back, a whimper coming out of him as Kenny V shouldered me up against the porch, then, without a word, started throwing punches into my chest and ribs and arms. I covered up, and he smacked me in the forehead and the temple, and I raised my hands, and then he went to work on my body. But he wasn't hitting as hard as Clay Whalen had, and a voice in my head said, This is it? This is all? I nearly clenched my fist and started punching back. But they both carried buck knives, and the one wailing on Cleary, Ricky Jay, was on top of him now, punching him over and over in the head. Then it was done. They were on the porch, breathing hard, looking down at us. Cleary was just getting to his feet, blood dripping from one eye and between his teeth. Ricky Jay lit up a cigarette and flicked the match over our heads. No more moaches, now scrow. Before we were even to the street, Cleary started laughing. He turned and yelled, Lose us! And we ran up the hill and across Main Street and down the alley to his house and mother. There were the Murphy brothers, four of them. They drive up to house parties where they didn't know anyone, walk in, drink what they wanted, smoke what they wanted, eat what they wanted, grab the butt or breasts of any girl or woman nearby, and if anybody ever said anything to them about it or even looked at them wrong, they jump them right there, four of them on one. Dennis was the youngest. He was tall and had dirty blonde curly hair and a cracked front tooth. It was a warm afternoon in April or May and Jeb and Cleary and I were walking back from Round Pond, a reservoir where there were woods and you could find kids smoking dope there in the trees or passing tall boys around in front of a fire till somebody called the cops or the fire department and you'd run and not look back. That afternoon, Cleary taught us how to get high just by breathing deep and fast for a full minute then have someone put you in a bear hug and squeeze till you felt your brain float up and fizz out the top of your head. I was afraid to do it. It seemed dangerous to me, bad for your heart. But I watched Jeb squeeze Cleary and dump him in the pine needles where he lay a long time, his eyes closed, his mouth open. When he came to, he was pale, but he smiled and said, That was boss. That was so friggin' boss. <laughs> We were on the sidewalk close to Monument Square. There was a sub shop there between a drugstore and convenience store. Sometimes the owners tossed out a pizza or a sub nobody ever picked up for takeout, and we'd find them in the dumpster out back, still warm and in the box, or wrapped tightly in white deli paper. Hey, faggots. It was Dennis Murphy. He ran across the street, then fell in step with us as if we knew him, <coughs> as if we were friends. How's it hanging? Sucking any hog? We never stopped walking, and he walked with us. He had a light pine branch in his hand, a foot and a half long, and he was slapping it against his palm as he walked. My heart was beating fast, and my mouth had gone gummy. We were getting close to the square, the gas stations and shops, cars driving around the statue of the Union soldier in the middle of the asphalt. An old woman was walking in our direction on the sidewalk ahead of us. She was short and small. Her hair was white. Even though the air was warm, she wore a thin coat buttoned to the top, and she carried two full grocery bags, one in each arm. I started to move to the side. I remember hoping Murphy wouldn't say anything about sucking hog as we passed her. Her eyes had been on the concrete, on where it was cracked and where it was heaved and buckled. But now she looked up at us, and she seemed to pull her groceries in tighter. None of us moved to the side, and she had to nearly step in the street as we passed. And that's when Murphy flicked his branch out and slapped her face, her eyes blinking and tearing up, and he kept walking. We all kept walking. Cleary laughed like he thought it was funny when I knew he didn't. I don't remember what Jeb said or did, but I did nothing. The old woman was yelling something at us. I could hear the shock in her voice, the outrage. She said something about the police and her dead husband. She yelled, I hope you're proud of yourselves, her voice tremulous and to walk beside Dennis Murphy for even another heartbeat felt like poison to my own blood, but I kept walking. In my visits with Pop once a month, I could have told him that story or the others, but why would I? Thank you. All right, I'm gonna do something embarrassing, but I have to. This young lady who's texting in the back, you have to stop. And I hate to publicly humiliate you, but we live in very rude times. 
and I'm, I, I, I have done 150 readings last year and a half, and this country is addicted to its gadgets. And I'm sure you may have a very good reason for doing it, but it's very disrespectful to me, and I want you to stop. Thank you. And I really hate to do it. I'm a guest in this home. She's probably a student here. I'm sure she's a lovely woman. But it's a real compulsion. And, you know, I, I introduced a good friend of mine who's in his 50s to an elderly lady friend of mine. And while she was saying hello to him, he was checking a test. <laughs> We've all become... There's a wonderful article about this, by the way, by a guy named Alan Kirby in Philosophy Now. You can get it online. He says, we're all in a trance. So anyway... I, don't mean, I, I feel terrible to say this to publicly humiliate you like that, but it takes a village to raise a child, and I have to speak up. All right, now, moving along. Um, just a few more, uh, just another minute or two about this, this book. So in a scene or two after that, I, um, I describe a grown man coming back from the army on leave, expressing to beat up my younger brother, who was 13. And he wanted to come home and beat him up because my brother was probably having sex with his 12-year-old sister, which was normal in this neighborhood. I lost my virginity at 13. Jeb was 11. My sister was late at 14. This was the early 70s. That's one of the things I was exploring in this book, the complete breakdown of social mores and how we were wild, feral children. Fathers went around. Mothers were overwhelmed. And anyway... So this 20-year-old man comes home, beats up my brother in front of me. I can't defend him. Uh, you know, I, I think I pleaded, and then he you know, threatened to kill me, and I, I just stood there praying for it to be over. As a freshman in high school, I was 5'1", 112 pounds. My oldest son, as a sophomore in high school, 6'2", 270, with a size 15 shoe. <laughs> Squats 500 pounds, plays football. He's who I wanted to be. I don't know who the father is, but I'm raising him like my own. <laughs> My younger son, who's a rock and roll drummer, Elias, six, he's freshman in high school, 6'1", 190. Thank God my daughter's a little thing, but... <laughs> so, I, I won't tell you the whole book, but I, I will just end with this, and let's have a conversation in the time remaining. Um, I snapped after he beat up my brother. I walked into the house. I was 14 years old. I looked at my face. I went to the bathroom, looked at the, in the mirror in my face, and I, I told my 14-year-old face, I don't care if you get killed. I don't care if you get stabbed, shot. I don't care. You're never going to not fight back ever again. That night, I started to do push-ups and sit-ups. I began to lift weights. I began to box. Much to my surprise, not only did I have athletic ability, I had boxing talent, I, and I developed a knockout punch. I never got big, but I got hard and strong, and but 18 months later, my brother and I were in a bar downtown on the river where, you know, anybody could go in. We, didn't, we were probably 17, 18, or 16. And a local thug pushed my little brother down the stairs. And I knocked his two front teeth down his throat with one punch. And it felt so good. I did it for the next 11, 12 years. And I'm not suggesting for a second that was good. I think if the book is about anything, it's about... Hopefully, if it, I, I'll tell you what I worked really hard on trying to do in this book, is to not romanticize violence. I wanted to do the opposite of romanticizing violence. The only filmmaker in this country who I think does violence well is, Quint, is um, Martin Scorsese. Because when you see Goodfellas, or especially Raging Bull, and you see that scene where Joe Pesci, the little brother, gets beaten up by his big brother, Jake LaMotta, played by De Niro, at the Sunday dinner in front of the kids, it is messy, it is ugly, it is so awfully destructive and negative and wrong. <clears throat> As a way to control my violence, please give me, don't, don't misunderstand, I never went picking on anyone because I hated bull bullies, I hated cruelty, I hated injustice. I go to a bar, I wait for some guy, I didn't care how big he was, to hit his girlfriend or his wife, and I try to put him in the hospital. <laughs> years later, and actually I was here with Garden Last Days a few years ago, one of the characters in my novel, The Garden of Last Days, is a, um, she is one of the, a composite, one of the hijackers from Saudi Arabia. And you know, when I began writing, I thought, well, I have nothing in common with this guy. Wrong. As I was writing, I realized I felt a real kinship in a way that disturbed me. Because I too, at one point in my life, welcomed death and didn't care if I died at all. 
because my self-hatred had plummeted so, had risen so high and my self-esteem had plummeted so low, I would embrace death before I would endure being, calling, endure my own reflection of myself being a coward. I couldn't do it anymore. But I knew I was on a very bad road. The violence, as violence always does, escalated. It got more intense. Um, and I'm not a big bad guy. I am, but I was a dangerous young man because of what I just described to you. I knew I was going to get killed by a much meaner, scarier guy, or I was going to end up in prison for killing someone else. Both things almost happened. I go, go into that in the book. As a way to control my violence then, I said, well, I'll box. You're supposed to punch people in that sport, and so I'll do that. And, and one night, and frankly this scene makes me believe in God, or certainly mysteries, certainly the divine, certainly things that we can't see that are at work, which is a constant surprise to me, is I was in my sweats, prepared, I was training for the Golden Gloves down goal, I was very gung-ho about doing it, I had my AU, AAU number, I was a few weeks away from competing as a middleweight, something made me sit down at my little tiny kitchen table in Lynn, Massachusetts, brew some tea, grab a notebook and, and a pencil, and start to write a scene. I had no intention of writing. I had very little exposure to it, even though my father was a writer, I had very little exposure to that. And, although there was, I can tell you about later. And it wasn't a very good scene. There's a wonderful line from Gustave Flaubert, the French writer. He says, a bad book comes in as sincerely from a writer's soul as a good one. <laughs> Man! Sincerity is not enough? No. It was a very sincere scene, but it was awful. But I didn't care because I was writing, trying to write from the point of view of a young woman losing her virginity on the hood of a Pontiac in the misty Maine woods. Comfortable, huh, ladies? <laughs> and um, I thought I'd been writing 10 minutes, and when I finished my tea, which was boiling hot, was room temperature. And, and more importantly for me, I was in this higher state of awareness that writing has given me the last 30 years. I just, I could see the room more clearly for the first time. I could see the linoleum was loose underneath the radiator, and the radiator was crooked. And I never noticed that duct tape around the refrigerator handle. And, and a few months later, I finished my first short story, which was abysmal, but I didn't care. Because I felt more like Andre for the first time in my life. I just felt like me. And I hadn't known, I was almost 22 years old. I hadn't known that I hadn't been feeling like me. This is why, Al, I'm always telling young people this thing. I cannot tell you how blessed I feel. Never mind the incredible blessings of a publishing career and, and I've made money and provided for my family, doing what I love. That's a blessing enough. <coughs> the deeper blessing for me, though, is since I was a 22-year-old kid, which is exactly 30 years ago, because I'm 52, I've been doing consistently and daily that thing that makes me feel more like me. Thomas Williams, whose novel you alluded to too well, The Hair of Har Harold Root. By the way, if you haven't read it, it won the National Book Award in 1975. Thomas Williams is one of these writer's writers that all writers know about, but very few people have read, and it's a crime. So get it, if you get a chance, go read The Hair of Harold Root. Williams is asked, Mr. Williams, why do you write? He says, oh, that's easy. I write so I don't die before I'm dead. <laughs> Isn't that great? So I'm going to end with this. We'll have a conversation in the time remaining. I apologize, I went a little late. Um, Hemingway, in a great letter to his editor at Scribner's, um, Maxwell Perkins said, you know, Max, the writer's job is not to judge, but to seek to understand. <laughs> I don't think Hemingway was suggesting that writers are less judgmental than anybody else. We know he could be a judgmental SOB, and he'd be the first to tell you. I think what he was suggesting is, and my father has written about this in a beautiful essay years ago, is that at the desk, the writing, if you're trying to write this character-driven, honest stuff that I try to write, must demand the higher parts of you. You must be less judgmental. You must be more patient. You must be more tolerant. You must be more merciful. You must be, really, you must summon all those Lincoln-esque better angels of your nature. I'm not suggesting for a second that if you want to be a better human being, be a creative writer, because I've met some real SOBs in this field. Not a lot, honestly. I am suggesting, though, that I could not, once I began writing fiction, do that daily morning act of writing fiction, trying to enter the private skin of another, as a woman said once, and then that night punch them in the face. That's my story. I'm sticking to it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I don't want that.
young lady to leave. I, I feel terrible she did, but you know what I'm saying. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Well, I read your books. Uh, My condolences. <laughs> Because he wrote the book and he knows a lot of them well. But um, it's an incredible, incredible life story. And in just listening to you today and hearing your values and the discipline that you have, that obviously has gotten you where you are, where did that come from? You know, I think it. Oh, I've been listening to Leonard, old Leonard Cohen lately. Have you heard the Leonard Cohen song? Um, we all have cracks. That's how the light gets in. Isn't that great? Yeah. And then there's this wonderful line from Khalil Gibran. Uh, let me get it right. Joy, grief carves a crucible in which joy is held. And then the French writer, Léon Blois, said this, and I just quote this all the time. Man has places in his heart which do not yet exist, and into them enter suffering in order that they may have existence. The truth is, and you know that I did not, uh, just actually two or three weeks ago, a friend's brother who's in his 60s and grew up in Worcester in a really tough way too, sent me a lovely email about this book, and he pointed out the, the, the willpower and discipline that I'd had in changing my body, and I, and I, for, I, you know, I was consciously trying to show changing my body, but I wasn't while writing this conscious of. I never, had, I don't think I ever had the word will or discipline in my head. I had workouts in my head, sit-ups, push-ups, bench presses, running, six-hour workouts, all this crazy stuff I did. The thousand sit-ups it took three hours to my lower back was bleeding. All this was fueled by deep self-loathing, deep suffering. I look at my son, my oldest son, and both my sons are golden boy athletes and they've got these beautiful muscular physiques and, and um, my oldest son especially has a real work ethic in the gym. I'll see, I'll see you know, on the, on the sixth rep he's really hurting and he'll get like 10 more. And I said, Austin, man, I'm just so impressed with your work ethic and I'm a little surprised because for me what was fueling me was fear. I was always afraid. And, 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 I, was, and I, I really just... I mean, you know, hurting on the fourth rep, I'd get like eight more, but it was, I was I always had images of, you know, so I could fight and, and survive. But he's had an upper middle class sheltered existence, private high school, two parents married his whole life, cars start right up, house, you know, 60 inch freaking TV. <laughs> and by the way, they have all these gadgets, and I tell them too to turn them off when they're talking to me. <laughs> and they don't. So to answer your question, I. It, it's only been the last few weeks. What's your first name? Kathy. Kathy. It's only been the last few weeks that I've had the insight that, wow, what a gift. Look at, look at the oyster. What a gift my suffering has been. Look at the oyster. We all know how pearls get made. If you don't, sand comes in to the shell. It's an irritant to the oyster. The oyster wraps mucus around it to eventually expel it, thereby making a pearl. So an irritant turns into a pearl. For me... My violent, scary, seemingly adultless, wandering, feral, wild child youth gave birth to a discipline in me that saved my life, but mainly because it led to an artistic discipline that led me onto a path of compassion. That's working. Thank you, though. That was a long, long, yeah. Kind sir. That's you. What? <laughs> Who's the kind guy? <laughs> That's what threw him, not the sir. <laughs> sir <did>. Okay. <laughs> when, when it came to involving your your friends and your family in the book, mm. what was their reaction to being included? Like Nicole seemed like she was the the one that was sort of the farthest away. And yeah. what was their reaction after the book came out? Yeah. Well, this, you, you're, you're nailing the most difficult part that remains for me the most difficult part, and I reckon. I suggest, and I, I know I'm not the only one in this room who's written about his or her life. What's your first name, sir? Charlie. Charlie. You heard his question, right? So, I'll back up. So, writing this, I remember years ago I read a, a quote by some writer who said, look, if you're going to write memoir, 
you should be able to sue yourself for libel. <laughs> oh, I like that. Oh, I do like that. And the only one I read was Tobias Wolff's This Boy's Life. And if you haven't read that, you really should, because it's a beautiful tale, so honestly told. Tobias Wolff's a great short story writer. And he grew up with a single mother, just the two of them. And um, very early on, um, the book begins with a truck going off a cliff, and the trucker getting killed, and the mother turning to Toby and say, oh, and he could see just how worried she was about him, that they saw a man die, and his head, he tells the reader, I knew it was a good time to make a play for souvenirs. <laughs> so right off when it was a manipulative little shit, and because he never lets himself off the hook, you trust him implicitly to tell you the truth the rest of the book. What I'm getting at is, Charlie, is I felt enough, enough years had passed that I could write, I felt pretty secure I could write honestly about all my, all my stuff. Um, I couldn't, I don't think 15 years ago I could ever have read out loud about not defending a, an old lady who got a branch in the face. I, I, 10 years ago I may not have been able to be public about it either. But now I'm, uh, I'm 30 years older than that 14 year old kid and I want to I wanna hug him. I feel fatherly towards the kid I was and I feel sorry for him and I don't judge him. Um, so back to your question about the family. So I wrote the first draft. And naively assumed, well, I'm just, it's, this is my little memoir, as a friend, mm. as, a, as a writer on a panel once said about, she says, I hate memoirs, I call them memoirs. <laughs> <laughs> Which we can get back to that issue, because I think she misunderstands. But um, I thought, I can write, a, it's going to be about me, I won't have to write about my family. And of course, how, do you, how does that happen? You know, yeah. this, this lady laughed out loud, what are you? Stupid? Yes, I was. So I finished the draft, and I give it to my publisher, and she says, well, you know, I don't know much about your family life, but it seems to me you're not going into certain details in the house you lived in. I left out, yeah, that my brother was being sexually abused by a grown woman from age 13 to 19, that he was suicidal and attempted it many times. My sister was gang raped and selling drugs. My other sister was so isolated it was, you know, probably pathological. My mother was overwhelmed and holding on with fingertips and pretty much giving up. And my father wasn't around, and that was just the beginning. But I didn't want to violate their privacy, especially my brother. Sex abuse and suicidal ideation is pretty damn personal, and that's his story. But a friend of mine said, yeah, but how can you write your story and leave that out? That's part of your story. Your little brother wants to die, and you can't stop him. But it was a real tough quandary, and I, and I have to quote the writer Richard Rousseau, who's become a good friend the last four or five years. And Rick, Richard Rousseau, you know, Empire Falls, uh, uh, all those great books. His new book is actually a memoir. But he wasn't writing it when he gave me this advice, and I, I want to share it with you because it's really, really smart advice. I told him how tortured I was. I said, I don't know. I don't know, I don't know how much to bring into my phone. I know that my editor is right, but I, I don't want to violate their privacy on and on. He said, well, if it were me, I'd ask myself, am I trying to settle any scores with this book? Am I trying to skewer anybody? And he said, if I came to the conclusion I was, he said, I, I, I might write it, but I wouldn't publish it. But he said, if I came to the honest conclusion, no, I'm not trying to hurt anyone. I'm just trying to capture as you know, subjectively as I can from the emotional lens of my own memory what those years were like for me. He said, then I'd go ahead and write it. And I knew as soon as he said it that I... I wasn't mad at anyone. I wasn't mad at my mother, my father. I didn't even feel sorry for the boy I'd been or the childhood I'd had. There are a lot worse out there. I just felt artistically inspired to try to paint it for whatever reason. So, Charlie, so, so then I, I, I open the doors and I bring in the, the, the truth of my house. One of the things I discovered, again, this whole notion of writing as an act of discovery, but, by the way, how's that possible? I'm writing a memoir. What can I discover? Well, I'm convinced that we, you know, for, unless we're, we're, you know, repressing some trauma, which can happen to people, may not have happened to any of you, but it, it might have. Unless that's the story, most of us pretty know what happened. But really, what the hell happened? <laughs> that's where we go to therapy. Yeah, I know, I know. My father was an alcoholic, and my mother was, you know, abused, and we lived in poverty, and I know my story. But you notice what the therapists do? They make you tell it. They make you go back. If you look at the word to remember. I don't know what the Latin or Greek root is, but the opposite is dismember. Chop, chop, chop. Remember means to put back together. All right, so, Charlie, so I'm putting it back together, and I think, okay, my strategy is I'm only going to write about my family where their, their experience intersects mine. So if I walk by my brother's door, bedroom door, at 4 o'clock on a Wednesday afternoon, and I hear the sounds of a grown woman moaning, 
sexually, I'm going to put in the moans. But I'm not going to the other side of the door because that's my brother's story. It's not mine. But the hallway is my story. And all right, so then I, I write the draft, and then I feel it's a much more honest book. And, and then I decide I'm not going to give them veto power, but I have to show them I can't sucker punch them with a published book. So I have to say, the younger sister you talk about, Nicole, she's not going to read it. She never will. She said it was a terrible childhood, and I'm not going back. No offense, I'll read your novels. I'm not reading this. That's completely fine with me. My sister Suzanne read it, and thank God she didn't have any big... Well, she said this one thing. Yeah. What was fascinating is she and Jeb, my brother Jeb, and my mother all had a, same, a similar emotional memory of the time. Even my mother, which was fascinating to me. But my sister, who is now a national leader in domestic violence prevention and works closely with Joe Biden and the Obama administration, she said, did you have to put in the big bag of dope for Christ's sake? I have an important job. Honey, it gives you a street, street crap. <laughs> so... I was really worried about my brother for the reasons I just said. So I call him up. We couldn't get together. We're both working. And, and I tell him, I think I need to put in, you know, the suicidal stuff, the sex abuse. It's like three pages out of 500, Jeff. But I, because one of the things I discovered, I took a route that a lot of young American, probably worldwide men took. I took my hurt and I converted it to rage and aggression. I became homicidal. Some guys throw a football with it or go to law school. I actually threw punches. My brother did, and this is a gross generalization, but I think there's some truth to it, did what more girls do. He took his hurt and his anger, he turned it inward, and he got so sick he wanted to die. So I thought it was really important to show the two psychic paths, the homicidal direction and the suicidal direction for the two boys in the family. So I tell him, silence, and Jeb's like, you know, he smokes, he's never worked out, he can kick my ass, he always has. So, Oh, jeez. <laughs> you know what my brother said? He said, well, brother, I would never want to step on anyone's tube of pain. <laughs> <laughs> and then my mother was equally generous, and then I'll shut up on this. We're driving, because I'm still a cowardly little bastard, we're driving, I'm looking her in the face, we're drinking coffee, I said, hey, Mom? Yes, honey. You know I'm writing a m m m Yes, I know you're writing about your childhood. Yeah, anyway, I'm at that part where you, I don't know, kind of gave up a little bit, and I'm stumbling along. Because the last thing I want to do is hurt my mother, who stayed, who did the best she knew how. She didn't descend into violence or abuse of us or, or drug addiction or alcoholism. She, but she kind of gave up, but she stayed. I don't want to hurt her. She says, Andre, she holds my hand. Don't you dare. I go, oh shit, I already did. <laughs> and she says, don't you dare, don't you dare not write anything because of me. I'm, I'm, I'm like, I'm well enough. Aww. She said, don't you write your story. That's your story to write, and you write it, honey. She said, besides, I'm so old, I just don't give a shit what people think anymore. <laughs> <laughs> <That's great. Yeah. laughs> Can I take one more? Do we run out of time? out those memories from memoir because when I think about my past it's sort of like an eight millimeter quick through vision of my past and I can't come up with details you know you what I'm going to tell you how to do it and you'll be able to do it um, what's your first name Rosalie Rosie <laughs> the truth is I have a good memory for quotes but it's not very good it's not good for a guy who wrote a memoir to say. My memory's terrible. <laughs> Trust me. No. Here's something very beautiful about the imagination and memory and the mind, it seems to me. So there's a wonderful line I use all the time in my creative writing fiction classes from the writer Ron Carlson. He said, details are for the writer only. They are the instruments by which we steer. I was giving a talk by which we steer. A lot of young writers think, oh, I'll put in the details later. And, and they're making a fundamental mistake, I think, which, which is this. Details are not the garnish on the plate. They're not the little cruet of tomato and lemon and sprig of parsley. They are the meat and potatoes. I was giving a talk in Dallas in an art museum. And the talk seemed to be going well. People seemed to be listening. Then after a while, like 15 minutes in, they're all kind of squinting at me. And every now and then, because I am from Havel, right down the river from Lawrence and Al, I'll drop an F-bomb I get so excited. I think... In conservative Christian Texas, did I just drop an F bomb in my talk? <laughs> I don't think I did. But I'm talking, I'm talking, and, and, and they're now they're looking really like they're mad. 
what, 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 what am I what, speaking Swedish up here? What happened? And I, and I reach for the water bottle as I'm as I'm sipping. I I see like 40 feet up in the wall behind me is this thin transom. It's you know really modern architectural design, but it's facing west and the sun is in all their eyes. <laughs> and who the hell designed this building? <laughs> but I, you know I didn't say that. I, I just kept talking and so imagine right, Ro Rosie. You might be writing from the point of view of a public speaker, and, and, and that one detail can change the direction of the entire story. You can say, yeah, you know what? Screw you people from Dallas anyway. You killed JFK. <laughs> Storms off, gets drunk, cheats on the, his wife with the waitress, all because of the sun in their eyes. <laughs> I found when writing Town that I was using the First of all, I wanted to read like a novel. I wanted to read more like fiction than nonfiction. But man, was I nervous. I did not want to make any mistake since James Fry's Million Little Pieces fiasco. You all know that story, right? He made up some stuff in his memoir. Everybody who's writing creative nonfiction is really careful. I would call people up, that was a trans -in, right? Wasn't it a trans or was it a... <laughs> <laughs> so I was within the parameters of what really happened. But again, now, what was it like? What was it really like to be in this thing that's happened? You must go to the five senses, as you do when you write fiction. So. Copy example, and I'll shut up. I'm sitting on my stoop with my brother. Um, and I remember this is a tiny little house in Newburyport, which, believe it or not, was a tough, ugly waterfront town 40 years ago. It wasn't a cute little boutique town it is now. We lived on one of the toughest streets. They call it Slime. It was Lime Street. They call it Slime Street. Across the street, the neighbor had raped his 27-month-old niece. It was that kind of, yeah, it was that kind of darkness. A drunk one night, more than one night, stumbled in up from the local bar and urinated in our front foyer because we had no locks on the door. But I remember, and Jeb and I were constantly being bedeviled by the local punks. A lot of them were now dead. And um, Jeb and I were sitting on the stoop, and, in, and Rosie, writing the memory, I remembered, I can still smell it. That stoop had a sweet smell to it, and years later I realized it was the lead paint flaking off the house. And then as I was describing with my pencil and my notebook and my little cave in my basement the, the, the lead paint smell, I also, yeah, I could smell dried piss of the drunks who peed on the sidewalk on the way home from the bar after the last call. And then when I smelled the sweet lead of the paint and the dried urine, another sense opened, a panel in my memory opened the way it will for all of us. And now, yeah, that's when Cody Perks and those guys saw us and they started to chase us and we were running through the lumber yard and then we were underneath the dock on the river and saw the drowned guy. And that's how the whole book came back to me. I mean, I mean, there's not any event in there that didn't, I didn't know about. But the deeper details of it came from the writing, which is a lovely thing. So I will end with this line from Grace Paley, the short story writer, who just left, left behind a beautiful body of work. She said when we write, we actually write what we don't know we know. Thank you all very much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Andre. Um, I neglected to tell people who don't know me that I'm Al DeCicio and I'm the provost at San Juan College and I'm happy that everybody's here today. We're going to continue this in the Bergdorf Gallery next door where uh, Andre is going to be around to continue the conversation with you and if you so desire to sign your books which are available for purchase. Um, and I know that there are many things I could say that you inherited from your mom and your dad, but you told us two things today that I definitely know you inherited that you can really light up a room, Andre. Thank you very much. Well.